Hi! Welcome back to the second video about word embeddings. In the previous video, we were training letter embeddings. And the model sort of looks like this. We had two tokens that follow up on each other. And then they both went into an embedding layer. Now note that the embedding layers that we had here, they shared weights. So these were exactly the same. And what would come out were vectors. Vectors of size 2. So you could say that the embedding layer is something like a dictionary. It's just that the values that we have in this dictionary are trained by the algorithm. This was then followed by a dense layer that would take these both in. And then we made a prediction because we were trying to predict the token that would follow these two. We also had a softmax attached to this dense layer. And that means that the output here sums to 1, and we're hoping that for the correct token we would have a rather high value, and that we would have super low values for all the other classes that we had here. And because we were dealing with letters and numbers, we would have 26 for every letter, plus 10 for every number, plus 1 for the space. We'd have a total of 37 classes here, and, and that's what we'll be trying to predict. In this video, I would like to extend this idea and apply it to words. So that means that these tokens that we have that go in here, that these are no longer going to be letters, but these are going to be words. And we'll discuss a few approaches that people have used in the past to get to sensible word embeddings. So I hope you agree that we can do practically the same thing we're doing here, but that we're going to do it for words instead. Uh, there's going to be a few differences, though. For starters, we're probably not going to be predicting just 37 values. If we're going to be training words, well, this, this number is probably more in the 10k to 20k range. Also, if you want to have 10 to 20,000 tokens that you want to properly embed, then probably having just two dimensions in your embedding layer is not going to be enough to encode all the information. So let's say that we're going to do like 100, or some large number k. And another thing to keep in mind is that maybe we should have multiple layers. And these ideas are all good, but there's an extra thing that we can do to make it just a little bit better. So let's briefly consider what a sentence and what words are. You could look at a sentence or a couple of sentences for that matter, as just a sequence of tokens that follow up on each other. But we can do two things. Currently what's happening is we're saying, well, let's predict this guy by looking at the two previous values. Uh, that, that's what we do with the letters. But maybe... If you want to know the meaning of this token, if you want to say, hey, we want to learn as much context as possible, then how about we don't just look at the past two tokens? Maybe we should also look at the future tokens instead. And this way, there's just more information that we can use to predict this token, which hopefully is going to result in more learning as well. And let's try to get some intuition on why that might be. So if we're going to do this for the words, right? Let's draw what the architecture might look like. So I'll have the tokens of two time steps back, the tokens of one time step back, token of one in, uh, ahead, and the token for two ahead. Now all of these tokens, again, are going to go through an embedding layer. And what's going to come out, again, is a vector. I'll just write down k. That's a, that's a hyperparameter. We can, we can pick that up front, but we don't want that to be 2. We want that to be larger in this case. And then what we can say is, well, let's, let's, let's first flatten that so it's one single array. And then I'll pass it to a dense layer. And, and th this might be a, a couple of dense layers. I don't know exactly how many, but at the end, we will need one dense layer that has the output that is equal to the vocabulary size. So in the letter example, we had 37 
But probably here we're gonna get something that's gonna go out. That's let's say 20k big. Right, so we have 20,000 words that we want to have an embedding for, so to say. So we're gonna make 20,000 predictions. And then again, the hope is that at some point there's gonna be the token that we wanted to predict. And for that token that we want to predict, well, we're sort of hoping that that's where we're gonna get our high probability value. And, and we're kind of hoping that this is like really close to zero at all the other places. That's something the algorithm should learn. Now, the way that this algorithm will learn this is because there is this loss that is happening here. We know whether or not the token is actually being predicted correctly. And from that loss, we calculate a gradient, which will update all the weights. So that gradient is going to move through this network. We're going to update this little dense layer. It's going to move through the network. It's going to update this little dense layer. And eventually it's going to make its way to all of the embeddings, which are going to get an update. And when these embeddings update, one of the effects is that we get these clusters that we saw in a previous video. All the vowels and consonants were clustered together because they have a similar meaning. And odds are a very similar thing will happen to these words too. And there's something that is fairly smart about this. This is unsupervised learning. The whole goal is to come up with all of these embeddings but the way that we get these embeddings is by coming up with a supervised algorithm. Now the supervised algorithm has what I will call X, which is the data that we're using. And we have this data set Y, which is this data set that we're trying to predict. But because we have a supervised task that links these two, a side effect is that we now have an unsupervised effect on these embeddings. And if we train this on a very large data set, let's say Reddit or Wikipedia, then we can generate this very large X and this very large Y by just doing this a whole bunch of times. And the hope is if we then just throw enough compute power at it, that we can come up with word embeddings that are generalizable and that can be used in different applications. So what we've done now is we've gone from a word to a vector. And a very common term for that is word to vec. But word to vec can mean different things. Uh, there are multiple ways of getting from a word to a vector. And the approach that I've discussed here, well, that is sometimes referred to as CBAO, which is short for continuous bag of words. And, and the CBAO way of thinking, it has merits to it. There's a couple of ideas that are really likable. We are still free to tune whatever hyperparameters that we're interested in. So we could change this K, for example. What we can also still do is we can apply some pre-processing to the entire sentence before we actually parse it. We can say remove all the capitalization, we can apply stemming, there's things we can do beforehand. We can even say like, hey, let's increase the context, right? So, so there's definitely buttons that we can tweak, and then that's nice because we can customize the approach to our needs. And, and that's good, that's definitely true. But there are also some downsides. One of the downsides is that when this 20K becomes very, very large, then the soft max that we have over here, not only does the soft max become expensive to calculate, but you can also imagine that there's gonna be some weird numerical things happening when there's 20,000 zeros and one one to get a gradient for. You might have to play around with learning rates in order to get a proper gradient. So that's a little bit suboptimal. There's also another issue, and that issue has to do with how we select these tokens. Because you can wonder what we are still doing is taking a window around the token of interest. And are the closest neighbors to the token, are those the things that supply us with the context? Or is there perhaps a better way of thinking about context and target tokens? So let's discuss Skipgram. So to explain the idea behind Skipgram, I figured it would be good to also have an example. So let's take the sentence, Raza has a really awesome office in Berlin. Now, if I were to take the continuous bag of words approach, and let's say I wanted to say something about this token, well, I would look at the neighboring tokens around it. But if I think about what Raza means in context, it's, it's a company, it's a tech company, and yes, they're based in Berlin, then probably the tokens that matter just a bit more are office and Berlin. And if I think about sentences in general, 
yes, usually neighboring tokens, they have a relationship, so that's valid. But sometimes a token at the beginning of a sentence has a very important relationship with the last token in the sentence. And if that's going to be the case, then maybe we should think about context just a bit differently. So here's a new approach. There is still going to be a notion of, hey, here's like a target token. But there's going to be another notion, namely of a context token. So here's a context token and, and there's a context token. And the way that I'm going to get these context tokens, well, we're kind of free in our choice of doing that. But for now, let's just say these are sampled at random from the same sentence. So that could also mean that the word really, for example, became a uh, context token, let's say. And we can do some pre-processing. We could say, hey, let's remove stop words and stuff, but let's take this as the premise. Well, then we can also come up with a data set where we apply a similar trick. We're going to do some form of supervised learning such that we can get these embeddings that hopefully have meaning. But what I'll do first is just create a simple data set. I'll have my thing called X, which is the thing I would like to use to make the prediction. And the thing that will be different is that the target word now Raza, that's not going to go into Y, that's going to go into X. That's the thing I'm using to predict Y. So I've got Raza here, let's say three times. And I have Office that I would like to predict. I have Berlin that I would like to predict. And I have the word really in this particular case that I would like to predict. So the idea is we're just going to skip a few n-grams, so to say. We're just going to come up with a definition of context that's relevant, and we'll just try to learn from that. This idea is sometimes referred to as skipgram. But there's also an architectural choice that's a bit different here. Because what you can do is you can say, well, you know, I have my target token. This is going to go through an embedding. Again, out comes a vector of size k. k is a hyperparameter. And next, let's say it just goes through one dense layer. It could be multiple, but let's say it's just one. And then here we're going to make our massive prediction once again. Right, so there's a softmax here as well. And there's going to be some index here that corresponds with Berlin, assuming the indices are sorted alphabetically. And then we'll have office and really down below. And the goal now is that this model shouldn't predict a single output, which we had in the previous. But the idea here is, is that we're going to train this model so that some of the some of the output, some of that probability mass, well, that has to go towards Berlin. And some of the other probability mass is going to have to go to office. and some of it is, have to, is going to have to go to really, and the idea is that the single token has to predict many different contexts. So the output of this dense layer needs to spread out its probability mass. But one of the things that's nice about this is you can actually repeat this a whole bunch of times. Let's say we make our first data set. I'll call that D1. And, and what we can do is we can say, okay, there's a data set. Here are some definitions of context. Uh, now, please update all of these uh, weights and gradients and then do all of that. And then what you can do is you can say, hey, let's do another data set. And maybe in this other data set, we will have Raza and Awesome. And that Awesome is now also going to be something that has to be predicted. And then we're going to do this again and again and again. And sure, this is going to be something that is relatively compute heavy because we have to do all of this sampling and we got to do it over and over again a bunch of times. But you can imagine that the embedding that's trained here will demonstrate other behavior. And the biggest hope is that you'll find an embedding that is really general. Now, you might have noticed that I keep using this word general. And you'd be right to ask, well, why is that? That has to do with how these embeddings are typically applied. So let's draw out an example where we show how you would use these embeddings. Let's say that you've got a sentence that's coming in. And, and this, this sentence has many tokens in it. Let's say it has M tokens in general. Well, then all of this is going to go through an embedding layer. And I'll just draw that as a large block now. But what's going to come out are these vectors. And remember, a single vector a single vector here that's a, that's a k-dimensional embedding where k is some large number. Now, let's say that in this instance, I'm interested in doing a classification task. 
uh, this could be sentiment analysis. This could also be classifying the intent of what the user wants to say in an assistant setting. Well, there's a neat trick you could potentially do now. I can take all of these vectors and create a matrix out of it. I'll just stack them together, and then this will be a matrix of size M by K. Then next what I can do is I can calculate the average. And I'm doing it over all of these vectors, such that I now have a summary vector that is 1 by K. Now I'm taking the mean over this axis. Then you could argue that this, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a sentence embedding. You could interpret that as a summary of everything that is in the sentence. And what's going to happen to that? Well, one thing that I could do is I can just give that to a very basic logistic regression model. And then I can say, hey, the X that I am using, the stuff that I want to use to predict a label, Y, well, you could argue that I have a very convenient trick to get from words to a numeric summary. One that, if it is very general, will help me out quite a bit. And the reason why it's so helpful is twofold. One thing that's nice is we're doing this averaging, which means that even if we have longer sentences with more words, then we can still apply this simple logistic regression because we will always have for every sentence one array with k floating point numbers in it. But that's not the best bit. The best bit is that I can draw an imaginary line, if you will. And everything that happens on this side of the line is something that can be pre-computed. I can have word embeddings that learned a lot from the English language in general, but then given those embeddings, then as long as the embeddings that I'm using are in the same language, then the numerical representation for dog and cat, well, they'll be relevant no matter what I'm doing. If I'm doing entity detection, or if I'm doing sentiment analysis, or if I'm doing any other sort of classification, those summaries will just inherently be useful. And that means that given such a pre-computed vector, which is something that a third party can provide me by pre-training all of this, well, that means that I only have to do this. And that's a huge benefit as far as performance is concerned. But there's another benefit if we're doing entity extraction. So what happens in entity extraction is, well, we just click this on top of maybe a recurrent neural network. And then what comes out of here is, well, there's an entity there maybe, there's an entity there maybe, and let's say there aren't any entities here. But then here still I have the same phenomenon. I only have to concern myself with this model that I'm clicking on top of the embeddings. But the thing that's really similar is, again, I can draw this imaginary line where this is the stuff that I concern myself with, where the stuff on this side is my responsibility, this is what I gotta train, but this is something that I can get pre-computed elsewhere. This is something that a third party might be able to provide me. And again, I can experiment so I can say, hey, let's uh, do CBOW here or maybe SkipGram. But there's also some other stuff that we can do. There are these embeddings called glove embeddings, and there's also BERT embeddings that we can click in here. And, you know, we can use an RNN, but another thing that we can do is we can use a fancy new diet classifier instead. But all of this, all of these options are available to us, but that's because we can download these third-party numerical summaries of words and what they might mean. Let's wrap up for this video, though. I hope you enjoyed learning about these two variants of word to fact these are just two ways to create word embeddings, but I'm sure you can imagine that there's many variants of these possible. Another popular variant of these embeddings is called Glove, which is something I will discuss in an upcoming video. I hope you'll stay tuned for that.